In this video, I will explain the very latest evidence-based treatments for sciatica from NICE, the UK's National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. Hi there, I'm Dr. Simon Freilich, consultant in clinical neurophysiology, bringing you the very latest unbiased knowledge, developments and treatments in neurology. In this video, I'm going to explain sciatica and which treatments have been reliably shown to be effective. Firstly, sciatica is a descriptive term for lower back pain which radiates down the back of the thigh and leg following the course of the sciatic nerve due to irritation of the lumbosacral nerve roots. It should not be confused with sciatic neuropathy where the sciatic nerve itself, which forms lower down, becomes diseased and is completely different. Let's look at the structures involved. Foremost, we have the vertebral bones which support our weight and protect our spinal cord. They are especially shaped to allow specific movements at different levels, but they also have to let the nerves exit this protected environment, and so they have small holes in their sides called foramina which allow the nerve roots to travel outwards. Between the vertebrae are intervertebral discs, which are impact-absorbing cushions. There are also many ligaments, both inside and outside of the vertebral column, which are primarily responsible for its stability and prevent hyperflexion or extension. And there are facet joints behind each vertebra, helping to stabilize twisting movements. There are also many muscles surrounding the vertebral column, allowing us to flex, extend, rotate and laterally flex. And finally, there are a variety of nerves all crowded into this tight space. Any of these structures, when strained, irritated, inflamed or compressed, can cause pain, but we will concentrate on the nerves. Here is a list of potential causes of nerve root irritation and or impingement that can be seen on an MRI. One of the commonest causes is intervertebral disc herniation. The mechanism of pain is understood to be primarily due to inflammation of the nerve roots rather than their compression. Here is a list of some of the mi microscopic causes which can cause radiculopathy 2, which may not be evident on an MRI. It's also worth explaining that nerve root pain, which is referred, is known as radicular pain and is different from radiculopathy. Radicular pain radiates along the course of the nerve root without neurological impairments. However, radiculopathy in contrast means an impairment of the nerve root's function. This will lead to dermatomal sensory deficit and or myotomal muscle weakness and diminished reflexes. Whilst the two often coexist, this is not always the case and the two can occur in isolation. Lumbar canal stenosis can be congenital or required. Causes can include scar tissue after previous surgery, inflammatory material deposition, disc herniation, ligament thickening and bone thickening. This can lead to progressive narrowing of the central canal of the spine or of the lateral recesses where the nerves exit towards the foramina. The classical hallmark is neurogenic claudication with symptoms exacerbated by standing upright and walking, particularly downhill, but is relieved by lying on one's back and forward flexion movements such as when walking uphill. Discogenic pain from degenerative discs accounts for around 40% of lower back pain and its mechanisms are complex and are still being understood. It's also worth mentioning facet joint syndrome pain, which is a common cause of lower back pain in around 30%. The pain can originate from either the synovial membranes, cartilage, bone or capsules of these joints, which are then transmitted by the nerves of the medial branch of the dorsal ramus. This pain is concentrated in the back and often radiates towards the thigh or groin, but not below the knee. It is often worse after being in one position for a long period of time, and there is often stiffness. The key to diagnosis is in the clinical history and examination for all of these conditions, making sure that one does not miss out on any red flag symptoms or alternative diagnoses. This can then be supported by imaging with MRIs or CAT scans, as well as testing how the nerves and muscles are functioning. You can see a more detailed explanation as to how clinical neurophysiologists such as myself localize the problem by clicking on the iCard above. Whilst there are many ways of treating lower back pain and sciatica, what are the most effective options? The NICE guidance is very exciting because they have really delved into the evidence of just how effective different treatment options really are. There will be some surprises here and one can find a link to the document via the link in the description box below. I should also point out that the NICE guidelines 
point out that every patient is an individual and will need advice and input tailored towards their specific problems and needs. They are only meant for patients in general and do not necessarily exclude certain benefits of some treatments to individuals. They are also not meant to cover certain scenarios such as back problems due to cancers, fractures, infection or inflammatory diseases. They also point out that all patients should be provided with advice that they can understand about this condition and how it is managed and how they can best continue with their normal daily activities and exercise. All decisions should be made in consultation with the patient. Let's start with what's not currently recommended. This can be due to a variety of reasons including lack of efficacy, high side effect profile, poorly constructed clinical trials and adverse cost to benefit profiles. Acupuncture, belts, corsets, foot orthotics, interferential therapy with percutaneous or transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, that's PENS or TENS, rocker sole shoes, traction therapy or ultrasound. Medications such as SSRIs, SNRIs and tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline are not recommended and nor are anticonvulsants such as the gabapentinoids. For low back pain alone without sciatica, spinal injection is not recommended. Disc replacements are not recommended and nor is spinal fusion unless part of a randomized controlled trial. What might be helpful? Well, within the conservative approaches, first of all, group exercise programs including biomechanical, aerobic, mind-body or a combination of the above, or combination approaches including manual therapies including spinal manipulation, mobilization or soft tissue techniques such as massage, exercise and psychological therapy such as CBT, it's recognized that encouragement and facilitation of return to work and usual daily activities is very important in managing this condition. When medications are prescribed to alleviate pain, this should be in a stepwise approach following the NICE guidelines on managing neuropathic pain. See the description box below for a link to this document. When non-steroidals are used, these should be at the lowest dose possible to be effective with consideration of their potential side effects and, where possible, anticipation and amelioration of them. Radiofrequency denervation is a useful and long-term solution for facet joint pain following diagnostic medial branch block if conservative measures have not helped. Epidural injections of local anaesthetic and steroids are useful for patients with acute and severe sciatica but not for neurogenic claudication in those who have central spinal canal stenosis. Spinal decompression is reserved for those who have failed to improve in terms of pain or function once appropriate corroborative radiological findings have been made. I hope you have found this video informative and it certainly challenged a lot of what I thought was traditionally correct. I hope to see you again in the next video and please do subscribe and give me a thumbs up. Many thanks.